Mix, you texted me after that match and you said, Martin, I reckon it was a good result for multiple reasons. Well, that is just the temptress, isn't it? Of course we've got to get you back on to explain. The All Black legend is back. Welcome back, Max. G'day, Martin. How are you? No, I was sort of... Um, my mind was really hell-bent on this All Black team becoming great by the time we play in the Rugby World Cup in 12 months' time. Yep. And to win the Rugby World Cup in France, you've got to beat in the quarterfinal um, France, Ireland, not sorry, France, uh, South Africa, uh, Ireland, or France it might be, I suppose, um, and then the quarterfinal, one of, the, one of those again, and then the final, probably, you know, probably England or Australia. So, you know, it's not easy. You've got to play three or four in a row. We're not performing consistently, but what we... What, to win that, we need to be able to dominate or beat any forward pack in the world. I mean, match maybe, but I think beat. And if we can't beat them, we're not going to win it. So I think we've made great progress in the, in the forwards in the last, well, since Jason Ryan's been on board, they've made steady progress, and that all came to fruition um, at this um, stadium, this fantastic Twickenham Stadium, um, you know, on the weekend. So you have to say that's a bloody pretty good result when you look back six months because it's probably been one of the worst years we've ever had in rugby. So much so that the All Black uh, head coach was his position was threatened. Um, he's now gone to uh, to Europe, played in the Autumn Internationals, and he's had a 38-31 win over Japan. So that's average. He's had a 55-23 win over Wales at, at the park, at Cardiff Arms Park, or the Millennium Stadium, or whatever you call it, um, which is an incredible win. 31-23 uh, against Scotland was a pretty average performance. And a 25-all draw against England, not a great result on the scoreboard, but a great result as far as uh, exposing our limitations and realising that we've got a forward pack that can beat anyone in the world. Um, and I reckon that's... A yeah, but hang on a second, way. Max. Okay, I'm going to put a counter-argument to that. I'm going to say, okay, for 70 minutes we were doing that, or as Eddie Jones, or actually, no, Sam Whitelock said for the first 60 minutes, we were in a very similar position against Australia and Melbourne where we had a really good lead, almost by 20 points, and then we just unravelled. How much of a worry is that for you, that in the last 10 minutes... I mean, we just we, when we got the ball, we gave it away. We were just hopeless in the last 10 minutes. The rugby game's 80 minutes, Mix. We can't be in a semi-final up 20 points with 70 minutes and think we've won it. I mean, based on that, can we? Yeah, and that's a fair comment. But the bottom line is um, there are a few things that we have to tidy up. So to finish what I was saying, if we're big enough and strong enough and ugly enough to beat a team like England on their home ground when they were up for that match, don't worry about that and we dominated them in the scrum dominated them in the line out, dominated them in the driving mall um, for 70 minutes that's pretty bloody impressive, I've never been part of an All Black side that's done that against England at Twickenham and in fact over 100 years is it, we've only lost two or three games over 100 years so, at Twickenham so you know it was a pretty impressive performance but we've got problems in the backs. When I say problems, they haven't ironed out their best backline yet. I don't think there is rhythm and unity in that backline. Every team we play against, we have trouble in defence. Our defensive record is poor. So, and that that accounts. That's one reason why uh, we're not playing consistently. Consistently, because I think our defence is poor. Um, and see, every 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 team we play can split us open in the backline. Well. That never happens, mm. you know, with an all-black team. So there's a, a, a few little issues to sort out there. Well, do we but look at the, the coach, line, Scott, do we look at Scott McLeod? He was the one that when everyone else got, got shot, he actually survived, and he's our, meant to be our defence coach. Yeah, well, I don't know what's going on there in, in the in the back line, but to me, there's no rhythm in defence. Well, can you explain that? What do you mean, Mix? Well, just explain that to us. Well, this is Murray Mixter with us on the platform. When there's no rhythm in defence, are you talking about the continuity of selection, the way that the players understand each other, the fact that, you know, Mwanga looks great one week, he's not so good the next week? I mean, is it, is it all in that same umbrella? Yeah, it is a little bit. Um, the, when I talk about rhythm and defence, it means that the guy they know what each other's doing around them. So, in other words, when you had Conrad Smith and Ma Nonu in the midfield, they had beautiful rhythm because they understood 
what each was was doing, you know. Mm-hmm. And they were, it was hard to split us open. Uh, and that's been the story for a, for the last couple of years is we've been split open by most teams we play against, which is our Achilles heel at the moment. And that's something that we have to resolve. So there will be changes in that back line before they play uh, the quarterfinal, semi-final and final of the Rugby World Cup. Um, but you'd have to say that Joe Smith's just come on board. Uh, he and Ian Foster were both sort of pretty savvy, smart um, back um, back strategists. So, you know, they'll, they'll probably get it right. At the moment, it's not right. Um, the other thing, to answer your question, why did we collapse? Because it was a collapse. Why did we collapse? Well, I think there's two answers to that. One is for some reason, the All Blacks seem to think that after after 50 or 60 minutes, they've got to bring on six new players. Yeah, totally agree with well, you, mate. Totally agree with well, you. That's a, lot, that's a lot of rubbish. Why would you take off a front row that was dominating England at Twickenham, dominating in a scrum? When have we ever dominated England in a scrum at Twickenham? I can't remember ever. Why would you take them off? Scott Barrett was dragged. Why would you take him off? It's sports science, Aaron mix. Smith. It's rubbish, mate. It's these boffins who sit around with clipboards and laptops and they do stats and they come up with figures. They call it analytics. Where's the feel for it? You're sitting there thinking the same as what we're all feeling. We're sitting there going, let these guys run these guys into the ground, let them pound them into the ground, let them be standing there after 80 minutes going, we dicked you for 80 minutes. How good would that feel? You don't feel like that on the bench. Yeah, I think you're right. I think you're right. It's uh, There is fatigue after 60 minutes, say, but it doesn't mean to say you've got to change them. And I'll tell you what, this is the biggest thing that I think we gained out of this these autumn internationals because we didn't gain a hell of a lot of respect. Uh, we we sort of held our own, I suppose, except for against Wales where some tries came and we, we looked great. But there's two areas that I think are, are interesting areas. One of them is mental strength, is mental toughness. Now, I'm not sure whether Gilbert and Oak is still involved, but, you know, this all-black um, pattern for the last 20 years has been getting better and better as far as mental strength is concerned. Now, you know, you don't win games on physical strength. You win games on mental strength, which gives you physical strength if you pick the right players. And so, you know, when you look back in time and you look at maybe the loose forwards, um, and you see the mental capacity of Richie McCaw and Jerome Kano and, and Kieran Reid, and then you look back a little further and Jerry Collins, these sorts of guys, really hard-minded, uncompromising, sort of, and uncompromising is the word. Um, and that's something that we have to learn again in our forward pack particularly, and, well, no, not, not particularly, both forward pack and our back line. So that, that's what I think is short. I don't know who's doing mental skills at the moment, but that game in itself, you learn more from your own mistakes than you do from the mistakes of others generally. Mm. Um, and, you know, I think those guys will be a hell of a lot harder mentally because of what has just happened at Twickenham. Mix, hell of a lot harder. Can it, so, when it comes to that, so when it comes to that leadership in that last eight or nine minutes, you know, you had Sam out there, you had enough players, TJ came on and, you know, he ended up botching a kick, but you've got enough leaders out there who know and have had that experience. That's why you bring those guys on, isn't it? I mean, I'm with you. I didn't want to take Aaron Smith off, but if you bring those guys on, they're the shutdown guys, they're the closeout guys. It's like your guy in baseball who comes on in the ninth innings. His only mission is to close that game out. You know, I just think it's inexcusable with that experience on the field that we don't close it out. I don't think we have got enough leaders. I mean, I'm hearing guys like, well, I, I'm not going to bring up names, but I'm hearing guys t- talked about as leaders who don't aren't worthy of being called leaders in an All Black team yet. Okay. Now, the only the only leaders we've got uh, in that All Black forward pack at the moment at this level um, is Sam Whitelock and Brody Retallick, you know, and this guy Scott Barrett. No, so he's a leader, yeah. Mm. They're quickly becoming a leader as well, which is really good. And of course, Artie Severe. And that's not bad when you look at it. But there's four players. That's half a forward pack. But, you know, you bring on all these replacements. Well, who are your leaders then? You know, and you, you change your halfback um, and you change the whole, um, every, you change everything. You change the, the game. Yeah, you do. Yeah. And the dynamic of the game. And, and why you take off Aaron Smith, I don't know. You know, and the other thing is, the, the, the sub players that are coming on, it's the same thing that happened against uh, Melbourne, wasn't it? Against Australia. 
you know, we brought on a whole lot of players with 15 minutes to go, 20 minutes, and we didn't play as well. No. So I'm saying to the guys that are making the decision, stop listening to your strength and conditioning guy and look at the performance of the players. And I'll give you an example of this. Yes. You know, if you're talking about hard-minded, mentally um, tuned-in players, you, you've got to look back a little bit uh, to, to understand it. Now, there's a guy called Rodney Soriallo and a guy called Razor Robertson. Now, those guys, neither of those two guys could hold down a, the six, seven, or eight position, but they played in all those positions multiple times. Why did they play in all those positions multiple times if they couldn't claim their own position? Is because they were bloody mentally tough, really mentally tough, didn't give an inch mentally. You know, and that this mental strength is a big deal, a big part of it. And guys that make the same mistakes week after week after week, and you can pick out those backline players. It's not too easy to pick it. It's not too difficult to pick out who the players were. Yeah, and I keep on making yeah. mistakes. I think Rico is one of you them. Know? Yeah. Good as everything good he does, well, he loses the ball in contact three or four times. That's that's not that's not how you play all black rugby, mate. You know. And you got a penalty, and you're kicking it out, and you don't find touch. There points. you go. Yeah. And and, and that happens on regular occasions. I mean, that's not good. So I reckon that they've got to learn from their mistakes, the coaches as well as the bloody players. But I'm encouraged because, you know, I know that if you can't win up front, you can't win really World Cups. Um, So I'm encouraged by what we saw from that front eight. I think it was just fantastic. And that'll bloody um, make us feel a lot better. People, the real people, not the media, but the real people that understand the game will think, Jesus, that bloody forward pack was pretty bloody impressive against England. Uh, well, you see, I asked you this question. There. I asked you this question on Friday, mate. I said, would a win versus England put this season? I've actually still got it written down. Put it, would it put it right or at least end the season on the right note? We were about five minutes away from putting it right. But I tell you what, Mix, I actually don't, the more I thought about it, the more I don't mind the result because I just thought it's a reminder that if we'd won that against England, we probably would all be sitting there thinking, oh, everything's okay, everything's rosy again. That was just enough of a bite that says, hang on a second, back the truck, it's not all perfect just yet. And I know, I mean, I hate the result, don't don't get me wrong, but I'm trying no, to look no, for a positive no, in that. It's, it's nowhere near perfect, but it's, it's looking a hell of a lot better. And like I said, the mental strength factor is a major it, is a ma- it decides who wins games. There's one other factor, and that's the referee. Now, nobody, there's nobody in the game that wants the 31st player to be the most prominent player on the field. No. But every time that Frenchman plays, he's the most prominent player. But it's not only that Frenchman. So you have to say to, the, to World Rugby, get your act together. Yes, mate. You well, know, Mix, did you know what all those penalties were for? I mean, in all honesty, as much as you love and know the game, did you know what every one of those penalties was for? I mean, there was one there with Cody no, Taylor had I the mean, ball in his hand and the next minute it's a free kick. And I'm thinking, what the hell is that about? I've often said, you know, if you can analyse and go back and look at a, a, a phase of play um, under the microscope, you'll find a reason to blow the whistle. Yeah. But if you have 28 penalties in the game and it becomes stop-start and the referee wins because he becomes a best-known player... Uh, by the time you leave the field, then it's it's a travesty of of, of justice as far as the game is concerned. Yeah, right. So, you know they've got to they've got to sort that out. There's no doubt about it because it wasn't only that referee. You look at Australia versus France, yeah, you know, that was decided by the referee. Yeah, Argentina um, and Christchurch, mate. Remember the Georgian referee who just I mean you know we call it. Look, I got one question for you before you go. And I know everyone's listening for the answer to this. Uh, but there's so many games that were decided by the referee on these autumn internationals. South Africa versus France, South Africa versus Ireland, New Zealand versus England. I mean, it, it, Australia versus Ireland the weekend. It's just game after game after game decided by the referees. That will kill our game. All right, I'm going to put this question to you. Dalton Papali'i, you saw him, you saw what he did, you saw how abrasive he is, you saw how physically he is. Is he the new answer at seven? How do we fit Sam Kane back into that loose forward trio? If you've got Barrett at six and you've got Artie at eight, how do, we, how do we accommodate Dalton and how do we accommodate Sam Kane? I think Dalton Papali'i and Artie Sevier together are covering the role of an open side flanker because he's not your typical open side flanker, Dalton Papali'i, because as I've said a dozen times to you, as far as a hunter and a gatherer, nah, doesn't really fill that. But dynamic with the ball on hand, support play, he's got a high work rate, he pulls off a lot of tackles. Is it, How many times does he touch the ball is the question you've got to ask yourself after the game. Does he touch the ball 28 times, 26 times like McCaw? No. He touches the ball about 12 or 13 times. So there's a big difference. That's how you assess okay. whether a guy is a hunter and a gatherer. 
So he's not quite there, but when you play those two together, they do a bit of both roles, the eight and the, and the seven together, so you can get by. Um, will Sam Kane come into play? Probably he will because he is mentally tough. He, he's lost speed, you know, no doubt about his lost speed, and he's not quite as sharp as he was a couple of years ago. Did he ever come right since those last injuries? Not quite sure. You know, it was a back or neck, wasn't neck, it? Neck, because the neck was the worst one. A bit one, of yeah. a worry. Mm. But he's a mentally tough player, and so if, he's, if he comes back with a vengeance, of course there's going to be an option. Time will tell. That's not what I'm worried about. It's what I'm worried about is getting the back line right so they can develop some rhythm in a short period of time. And hopefully those two, as I've talked about, Foster and Joe Smith, are savvy enough to realise we've got weaknesses in our back line defence and our decision making. Always a pleasure, my friend. I love talking to you about this, Murray Mexter. Let's get it. Let's get. Let's let's do it again after England play South Africa this weekend. Because that's. Let's just pretend that's the World Cup final. That you know the the Poms have got there and they're playing a replay of that final. Let's because that wraps the whole season up. The mix with us.